Hi everyone, my name is Joanna Chai and I am Vice President in the Competition Practice of Charles River Associates based in Washington, D.C. The topic we are going to explore today is cartel deterrence. There is a consensus that deterrence is the principal reason why sanctions are imposed for competition law offenses. How can we best deter cartel offenses? How should legislatures, competition authorities, and other policymakers analyze this important issue? These issues are important in setting and revising penalties, but also relevant to other issues like the structure of leniency programs. The particular questions that we will explore on today's program include, should we penalize the firm, the actors, or both? What specific penalties should be employed? Should the existence of private damages be considered? With us here today, we have three world-renowned economists to share their insights on this, these topics. The panelists in the order of presentation are Dr. Frederick Jenny, who is professor of economics at Essex Business School, former judge on the French Supreme Court, and chairman of the OECD Competition Committee. Next, we have Dr. Dan Rubenfeld, he, who is the Robert L. Bridges Professor of Law and Professor of Economics Emeritus at UC Berkeley and Professor of Law at New York University. Finally, we will also have Dr. Jorge Padilla, who is Senior Managing Director and Head of Compass Lexicon EMEA. Welcome, everyone. Fred, to kick off, could you start by giving us an introduction to the economics of crime and the literature in this area? Uh, thank you, Joanna. Yes, I will uh, give a short introduction to uh, the analytical framework that economists use to think about crime and punishment. Uh, the second thing I want to do is to give some insight from this very simple model and finally to leave you with two or three issues that we may discuss later on. Uh, the economist uh, who actually uh, set up the framework to think about crime and punishment is Gary Becker who wrote a celebrated article on this and Gary Becker starts by looking at the cost of crime or the cost of violation and if we think about uh, uh, cartels for example the cost of cartels and he divides the cost of violations into three categories the first is the damage from the violation itself uh, when the prices go up some people are not able to buy the thing anymore other people have to pay more than they would they have a damage and this is the first dimension of the social cost of this violation the second uh, cost of the violation is the cost of the enforcement of the law which prohibits this violation. That requires a competition authority, it requires courts, it requires investigators, it requires time, uh, etc. And this second cost, the cost of enforcement, uh, in a very simple way, uh, is a function of the number of violations and uh, the uh, standard of proof, uh, if the standard of proof is very high, it's going to be very costly to get a conviction uh, in terms of public resources. Um, and finally, it is a function of the probability that the violators be, will be caught. If there is a very low level of enforcement, there is a very small probability that violators will be will be caught and the enforcement doesn't cost very much because it's not undertaken. Uh, so we've got three variables there, uh, the quantity of violations, the probability of uh, finding a violator and sanctioning the violator, and uh, the standard of proof. The third type of cost, interestingly enough, is the cost of the sanction itself. Uh, the fact that uh, when you sanction someone, uh, there may be costs associated with it. One of the practices that we know in the U.S. is that uh, cartelists may end up in jail uh, for, I don't know, let's say two years. So that's 700 days in a jail. 
Uh, I don't know what the cost of a day in jail is in the US, but I know what it is in France. It's about 1,200 euros. So that's 700 multiplied by 1,200 euros, uh, which is a lot of cameras and a lot of guards and uh, not much uh, luxury, but that's what it costs. Okay. So that's the cost. Or if I take another example in competition law, if we impose a, uh, an injunction, for example, on violators, uh, well, this injunction has to be monitored to make sure that the firms, in fact, uh, abide by what they should uh, uh, abide by. And this is, again, a cost of sanctioning. Okay, what is going to be the cost of sanctioning a function of? Well, it is going to be a sanction, again, of the number of violations. Uh, second, the number, the probability of people being caught. Uh, and it is going to be also a function of the type of sanction which is used. And as I just suggested, the prison time is more expensive for society than some other types of uh, sanctions. Finally, the last element is that at the heart of the model of uh, Gary Becker is the idea that uh, the violators are rational people. They are people who make a uh, uh, kind of a computation between the risks and, uh, of losses and the probability of benefits from committing a violation. So they know that they can be caught with a certain probability. Uh, we know that they know, or at least they are assumed to know, where the sanction is going to be in that case. So that would be on the losing side but they have one minus that probability of not being caught and of getting uh, a profit out of their violation. Now, the point that Gary Becker is trying to make is what should society do given this framework? And his main point is that society should try to minimize the cost of violations for society. Minimize the set of the three costs which I have uh, mentioned the cost of damage, the cost of enforcement, and the cost of sanctioning. And what are the tools to minimize this uh, total cost of uh, violations? There are two tools. One of them is the probability of uh, violators being caught, because this is the intensity of the enforcement activity of the states. So that's in the hand of the states. How much resources does it give, uh, and how efficient are the, uh, the uh, competition authorities or the courts? Uh, to find the violators, um, so probability of sanction. And second, the severity of the sanction, which is usually something which is uh, uh, written into the law. Uh, if you cartelize, if you participate in a cartel, this is the kind of sanction that you're exposed to. To make a long story short, to make sure that violations are not committed, that there's a deterrence aspect to the enforcement, is one condition that must be made. And that condition is the fact that the sanction of the violation must be larger than the profit to the violator divided by the inverse of the probability of him being caught. So for example, if a violator gets a gain of 1,000 and he has a probability of 1 over 10 of being caught, then the sanction should be at least 10,000. A more common sense way to say that is that crime should not pay. Okay. So public institutions have to play with probability and the sanction to make sure that crime doesn't pay. Okay. So having said that, uh, what are the insights that we get from uh, this model? The first is that the sanction, if the sanction must be related to the gains that the violator has gotten from the violation, that suggests that competition authorities should be interested in assessing this gain. By how much has there been an overcharge, for example, in the case of a cartel? Because this is the gain, and ideally, at least, we want to divide this gain by the inverse of the probability of being caught. Uh, okay. But that means that the kind of uh, information that the competition authority should uh, look for is uh, not only the uh, total sales, uh, but also the increase in price, uh, to get some sense when the, uh, the violation has led to an increase in price, some sense of the importance of the gain to the violators. The second insight that uh, I want to talk about is linked to the first one. In many competition laws, there is in the law a maximum sanction. 
a maximum which is either as a percentage of turnover or sometimes in some countries as an absolute number. Now this is very strange and this is not really in line with the economic reasoning because the economic reasoning said you know it should be the benefit divided by the inverse of the probability so whatever that is uh, so it may be much higher than the ceiling that you set once and for all so there is a disadjustment there with the idea that maybe particularly for cartels um, the sanctions are not uh, always sufficient because the law prevents the people from making them sufficient the third insight is that clearly in the model I have in mind the sanction of the violation is the monetary loss or the equivalent of the monetary loss to the violator. Now the monetary loss can come in different form. It can be an administrative sanction, but it can also be the damages that are paid to the victims uh, who, who sue uh, once they have the proof of the, uh, the violation. So there's an economic argument to say that for deterrence we should treat uh, damages uh, in the same way that we treat sanctions and we should aggregate them both to know whether there is deterrence or not. Now let me finish with the issues that uh, I wanted to um, uh, mention. Uh, the first issue is the fact that in most countries, including in the US, there is a legal principle of proportionality of sanction, which for example in the US uh, basically says that uh, there shouldn't be excessive bail or excessive fines imposed, uh, and this is part of the amendments of the Constitution, but there's the equivalent in the legal system. So the judges have a notion that there should be a proportion between the, uh, the violation and the sanction. And the economists, as I explained, say there shouldn't be a proportion, or the proportion can be enormously different from, you can get a huge sanction for a very small damage if you have a very small chance of being caught. And this is one of the reasons why in many countries courts tend to overturn the decisions of competition authorities because they think that the sanction which has been imposed, even though it's probably not even deterrent, but are too high. I mean, they don't respect this principle of proportionality. So we have a slight disconnect between the legal theory and the economic uh, theory. Um, the second uh, thing is linked to, if we were to follow the economic model, we should, competition authority should use optimal sanctions. Now, some economists have computed what those optimal sanctions should be. They've taken the gains of the uh, cartelist and they've divided that by the, uh, an, an estimate of the uh, inverse of the probability of being caught. And they've come up with the fact that most firms would not be able to pay those amounts. And this has been a, one of the arguments which has been uh, presented to say that the sanctions for cartelists should not be administrative fines but they should be prison terms. Because if you impose administrative fines on firms, either you're not going to be deterrent or they're not going to be able to pay it and they're going to go bankrupt, which is not going to help competition. And my last point is related to uh, the second one. When we think about administrative sanctions, we move away from the very simple model of Gary Becker where it's an individual who violates the law and he pays and he has a benefit. We're talking about a corporate body. And the question really there is who pays the fine? Who pays the sanction? Is it the executives? Probably not, unless they are fired. Is it the shareholders? Because they will have fewer benefit. Is it the consumers? Because in the end, the firms will increase their prices to recoup the losses. So this is also an argument which is used to say that administrative sanctions are not necessarily a very good way to sanction cartels. Thank you, Fred, for that very clear and interesting discussion on the economics of crime and detection, deterrence. Um, Dan, uh, anything you would like to add to that? Any reactions? Uh, yes, just a, a couple comments. Uh, um, thank you, Fred. So uh, as you stress, the, the, the Becker model, uh, which is one that uh, most economists uh, follow uh, to a large degree, uh, stresses the rationality of the actors. And, uh, and the goal here is deterrence. It's very important to, to realize that we're trying to deter 
and we're deterring people from engaging in an activity that essentially has no social benefit. So, uh, uh, you know, in, in a, if we, were, we had a perfect world where we, where deterrence is working perfectly and we never made mistakes, we would, we would probably uh, um, sanction incredibly high penalties for a cartel activity. Uh, that's one thing to realize. So why don't we do that? Well, one of the reasons is that uh, the world is not perfect and we may make errors and uh, we don't want to, uh, to uh, impose a penalty on someone who in fact was not responsible. And the, the process of determining whether someone who's been involved in the cartel activity, particularly the individuals versus the firm, can be very costly and very difficult. And so that's more or less supports to some extent the idea of proportionality that Fred was talking about. There may be some reason to, to be to consider uh, whether fines are too high. Uh, but generally, the evidence uh, that uh, I've seen uh, 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 from the literature, people have studied this, suggests that, as Fred suggested, that we're, we're actually uh, uh, under deterring, that the fines are, are way below what would be optimal. Uh, and that's based partly uh, on, on the fact that there are huge social costs and, and a belief that uh, we've been pretty accurate in, uh, in prosecuting uh, <coughs> cartel activity. In the U.S., which I've followed over the years, uh, there's substantial belief that, uh, that there's much more cartel activity, uh, including bid rigging and, and uh, as well as more traditional uh, price-fixing cartels, much more than we've actually been able to, to prosecute. So uh, um, I hope we take into account those considerations as well. Thank you, Dan. Um, with respect to uh, Fred's discussion, I, Fred, I was wondering if, um, if uh, you could talk a little bit about there's this probability of detection that you mentioned and this, you know, this uh, comes out of these econo this economic model. Um, in practice, um, how do jurisdictions evaluate the probability of detection in cartel cases? As you know, um, you know we don't know what we don't know, right? Um, and so uh, maybe you could talk a, a little bit about, you know, about in practice and in implementation, you know, how, how that's been treated. Um, there are, I think there are several issues in, in your question. Uh, one of them first is from the theoretical point of view, there are techniques to try to estimate, uh, to have some estimate of what the possible number of cartels around are. For example, you can base yourself on uh, the length of time of cartels, how long they've been going on, to assume that there are some other cartels which are going on, etc., and, and, and through mathematical uh, means you can, like this, get an estimate of how many there are. I've never seen, personally, a competition authority make any calculus whatsoever on what the, the uh, probability of being caught was. Uh, what I've seen is competition authority referring to articles in the literature. For example, for a long time, there was the idea that uh, possibly if we talk about uh, uh, price fixing, uh, maybe one in ten was uh, something reasonable uh, to assume. Okay, so sometimes competition authority will take this as a ballpark and say, well, it means that uh, uh, a sanction which would be 10 times uh, the amount of the gain uh, would not be out of line because, roughly speaking, uh, the probability of being caught is uh, 1 in 10. Uh, but there is, a, there is a, another problem, uh, which is the fact that the competition authority, uh, through its enforcement action, determines what is the probability of being caught. So that's why competition authorities don't usually go very far in the analysis of uh, those probability, because if they come up with the fact that the probability of being caught is very small, they are likely to be found to be not doing their job. Uh, okay. So they leave it to the academics to decide where the probability could be. So it's not a, a terribly uh, uh, precise job. Um, but we do have, through economic studies, some interesting and mostly converging ideas about uh, an order of magnitude. I mean, you know, very vague, and I wouldn't vouch for it, but, but it, it gives you some sense. So, in, in summary, we don't need to be, you know, exact or precise necessarily, um, but rather than in terms of degrees. Um, 
of, of, of the probability of detection. It would be great if we were. But... <laughs> uh, maybe that's, a, that's an area for future research. All right, let's, um, let's move on to our next topic um, on the type or types of sanctions that should be employed. Um, Dan, could you um, present the issues to us and discuss the costs and benefits of the different types of sanctions? Uh, I'd be happy to. So uh, in the, in the uh, brief time I have, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, the possibility of sanctioning both individuals and sanctioning uh, the firm and uh, also uh, considering uh, uh, sanctions that are in terms of fines or, or uh, possible uh, uh, prison sentences. And uh, also I want to brief, just briefly give reference at the end to the possibility of uh, compensating victims through uh, private actions which have been growing, uh, growing around the world. So how do we think about what type of sanctions should be employed? Uh, we, of course, in the background are going to rely on the Becker model that we've talked about. But, uh, but to think about the type of sanction, we have to introduce a different uh, area of economics. And that's the uh, theory uh, that talks about the, the relationship between principles and agents, so-called principal-agent theory. <clears throat> and the reason that's important is that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the principle that we care about uh, uh, is, you know, is the public, the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the owners of the firm, if we're talking about a firm that's going to be, uh, I shouldn't say the public, the owners of the firm that is, is at issue. And the agents are the employees, the, the managers of the firm. And uh, there are going to be some cases where the agents and the principal are the same thing. Uh, if I happen to own my own business, consulting business, I might be both the principal and the agent. But if we're talking about large corporations that are, that are involved in a lot of the activity we're talking about, there is a, uh, there is a uh, distinction between the principal and the agent. And the, 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 the principals are typically, if it's a public firm, they're typically the shareholders of the firm, and the agents are the managers of the company. And there's a real question as to whether the, uh, the, the agents are always acting in the interest of the firm. The agents may be more interested to some extent in their uh, ability to get promoted or increase their salaries or increase their job opportunities. And those are things that are not likely to be of concern to the firm, uh, the owners of the firm, who would like their, their share prices to, to continue to increase in value. So when you, when you have that distinction, uh, we have to think about uh, how to penal, who to penalize, and that, that takes us into the different types of sanctions. Uh, and we want to see how those sanctions relate in terms of principal agent theory. So for individual sanctions, it, may, it makes some sense to sanction both the individuals who are managing the firm uh, and as well as the firm itself. We want to sanction the individuals because we want to make sure that their incentives are to worry and can be concerned about the impact of the firm. Uh, and uh, their interests might be otherwise be concerned with their compensation. On the other hand, we may want to sanction the firm as well because, uh, because we want to get them, give an incentive uh, t uh, to, uh, to people who, to the shareholders to make sure that they're, they're hiring and and promoting the managers who have the interests of the firm in mind. And uh, <clears throat> so with that in mind, uh, uh, individual sanctions make some sense. And uh, most, many jurisdictions allow for, uh, for individual sanctions, uh, and uh, as well as sanctions on the firm. The US, in the US, uh, that has been the tradition for, for a substantial period of time. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, we talked about deterrence as one of the goals of, of the program uh, we're talking about, but another goal is to try to in, create incentives for the firm to, uh, to introduce and seriously uh, uh, make sense of compliance programs in the firm. I recall when, when uh, many years ago when I was the Department of Justice and we were investigating certain cartel, cartel activity, I was surprised to find that a number of the firms we were prosecuting had no compliance programs of, of any kind. Um, that's changed over the years because I think the U.S. has been quite active in this area, and I think uh, you would find that almost every firm 
has, has uh, at least one individual concerned with monitoring compliance. So uh, just to take the U.S. as an example, uh, um, uh, well, I should, add, I should add, first of all, the, uh, I should add that we're, we also uh, need to talk seriously about custodial uh, uh, penalties as well, where we, in fact, impose prison sentences. And so in the U.S., as an example, uh, the U.S. has imposed fines on both individuals and firms. Uh, and uh, the U.S. has also been probably the leader in imposing, in imposing custodial s sanctions, that is prison time. Now, and as far as I, as I understand it, uh, speaking more worldwide, there, there are many countries that have uh, prison sanctions as an option on their books, probably over 30 uh, countries have that possibility, but as, to my knowledge, only three countries have actually imposed uh, sentences that involve people serving prison time. And the U.S. is one of these, uh, and the, 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 uh, the U.S. has continued to be active in actually imposing prison sentences. And the reason is uh, that uh, it, there's, there's reason to believe that the fines, as Fred suggested, are, are, that are actually impo imposed will not be sufficient to generate deterrence for various reasons. But there's nothing like imposing a sentence on one or more individuals in a firm to, to uh, cause them to be penalized. And I can just give a couple examples of how this has worked. At the, at the time we're speaking, uh, there's a case that's just been resolved where an individual who is the CEO of, of one of the canned tuna companies in the U.S., Bumblebee, uh, decided to go to court. And he was prosecuted uh, individually, even though the firm had paid substantial uh, fines itself. And th this case went to trial, and the individual uh, lost the trial, and the court imposed a $100,000 fine on the CEO of the company, as well as 40 months in prison. Now, that case is being appealed, so we don't know how it will finally be resolved, but, but at least at the moment, it looks like there will be a prison sentence. Uh, the other thing I want to mention briefly is that we do have private, uh, we do have in the U.S. The, the right for private individuals to sue. Their goal is primarily deterrence, primarily, excuse me, compensation, but there may be a deterrence a, a component as well. And those, those penalties can be very, very substantial uh, on, in, on, uh, on firms brought through the private sector. Uh, and that's been true not only in the U.S., but also in many countries around the world. For example, I happened to be involved a couple years ago in a case in Australia where the two largest uh, makers of cardboard boxes were, were substantially fined uh, for, for their joint cartel activity. Uh, uh, fines were in the, over, I believe, over in the $100 million range. And penalties were imposed on the CEO of the company as well as the general manager, again, with the goal to find deterrence and apply it both to the firm and to the individuals to deal with the principal agent problem. That's it for me. Thank you for that, Dan. Fred, any reactions or thoughts to, um, to, to Dan's um, thoughts on the types of sanctions and, and prison terms? Well, I, I think that I tend to agree with uh, everything that uh, Dan said. Uh, um, there's been quite a bit of discussion, uh, certainly in Europe, but uh, not only in Europe, recently of individual sanctions, uh, and in particular, for example, of disqualification, uh, where a, a senior executive is banned from the industry or possibly banned from any industry for a number of years. So this is a personal sanction. Uh, um, it has an advantage in the sense that it is less costly to implement than a prison sentence, and also it has the advantage that it cannot be easily passed on to someone else as a fine uh, would be. Uh, the UK and Australia have been particularly uh, active uh, on this front as being one type of sanction, sometimes an additional sanction to the more uh, traditional ones. Um, um, I wanted to uh, just make two comments. One of them is on compliance programs. Uh, one of the questions that competition authority face in many jurisdictions is what to do when they catch a violator who has a compliance program. And in spite of the fact that there was a compliance program, there was some violation. When it comes to sanctioning the firm, should the existence of the compliance program be an aggravating circumstance or should it be an exonerating circumstance? 
And I would say that the jury is still out on this. Uh, I mean, of course, the business community thinks that it should be proof that the firm was uh, meant well and that uh, it must have been rogue employees uh, who were doing this. But uh, the proof that it was a rogue employee or a set of employees is not always uh, there uh, uh, easily. So this is something to think about, uh, probably on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, the second thing is that, at least in Europe, what seems to be coming, even though Europe has been well known for meeting out extremely, I mean, I mean the Commission, uh, very large uh, administrative sanctions, uh, more and more I get the feeling that what deters the firm are the risk of civil suits uh, in courts. Um, and that the efforts that the Commission has uh, undertaken to facilitate class action uh, in order for victims to be able to uh, get damages has been quite uh, a change. Uh, uh, it has led to quite a change in the, in the attitude of firms. This raises another issue, which is the issue of the relationship between the competition authority and the courts. Because very often, the competition authority has all the elements that would help the, uh, the courts to find that there is a violation and therefore to award damages. But the question is, to what extent does the court have access to some of this uh, uh, information? And I know of a few competition authorities who are decidedly not on the side of helping the courts uh, which lowers the possibility for the plaintiffs to make their case uh, in court. Um, and uh, because the competition authority has the economies, it has the experts who are able to help uh, with the evidence. Also, it has uh, uh, powers of evidence, uh, which the courts don't always have to the same extent. So that question uh, for the deterrence of the system is also an important one. Uh, the competition authority is helping the courts uh, at least at the level of establishing the violation. Uh, well, can I jump in and add a comment to what Fred just said, uh, Joanna? Just briefly, I, I, I was thinking of uh, an example of a uh, cartel case that I happened to be, be working on where I was doing some work for, for the defendant, and the case uh, eventually uh, was going to be settled between the parties, and the, the government that was prosecuting uh, uh, said that as part of the settlement, uh, I would have to personally agree to provide all of the work I had done to the relevant parties, uh, in both the government and any private parties that were concerned. And uh, I thought that was an interesting uh, demand as part of the settlement because absent such an agreement, and I, d I did do that, uh, I actually spent some time briefing people on the work I had done. I think part of, without that settlement, uh, the, the information that was gained by the government prosecution would not have been passed on to those that were pursuing the case privately. On the, on the topic of the type of, of sanctions and the ones that are imposed, um, have you either uh, situations where the jury or the judge finds it harder to impose, say, a prison term as opposed to monetary fines? Um, or, you know, as Fred had said, you know, maybe perhaps, you know, the uh, barring someone from working in an industry again, you know, could be um, in some sense a, a cheaper alternative in terms, of, in terms of the cost on the system, on the government system, but also at the same time um, could have the effect of deterrence uh, without it being so difficult to send someone to jail. Well, I would say the, the, the cases that I'm involved in, the, the, I, I, do see, uh, um, I do see concerns along those lines. And this goes back to when, when I was in the government, when we were prosecuting the Lysing cartel, we had some, some questions as to who we ought to impose, who should be the person who's the subject to, to these custodial penalties. And it wasn't obvious, uh, necessarily obvious, who was the right person. In, in the particular case I'm talking about, the key executives were not in the United States, so it was not easy to prosecute them. And so eventually the, the individuals who were prosecuted would be, would be further down the line. They were involved in the cartel, but they, they were clearly not the persons who, who really, um, I would say, organized and supervised the cartel. So the, 
there's an underlying concern of proportionality. And I've seen the same thing in other cartel cases where, uh, where a certain individual happens to be chosen to serve the custodial penalty when that individual uh, may have been involved in the cartel activity, it probably wasn't one who took the lead. Uh, and so there is a, a, a sense of discomfort uh, in that we're not really achieving a goal of proportionality here. And in some sense, you know, if you got this great tool um, that would be uh, very effective at, at deterrence, but on the other hand, if it's rarely actually used, then um, it would not achieve the effect of, of actually you know, becoming that deterrent that we need. One of the interesting questions is whether jail terms really have a deterrent effect which is far superior practically. And where economists, I think, are very uh, short on answers is that it's very hard to assess uh, whether a sanction has, in fact, not in theory, in theory it's easy to think about it, but in fact whether this has led to a decrease. Uh, and we have had this kind of discussion for uh, jail versus administrative fine. This is between, let's say, the US and the EU. But we've also had a discussion about uh, whether, com uh, whether uh, leniency programs had uh, uh, a deterrent effect or not. Um, the problem is that the evidence is not there that there are that many fewer uh, cases than there used to be. Uh, but it may be for other reasons that there are not many fewer. So, so assessing the reality of the deterrence is not so easy from the economic point of view. All right, I want to uh, move on uh, to should the firm or its agents be punished? Jorge, um, can you talk about, um, you know, uh, can you talk about whether it should be the firm or its agents that should be punished and why? Thank you, Joanna. Um, I'm going to uh, try to answer that question within the framework that we have been developing and that uh, Fred started uh, with earlier today, which is the goal of deterrence. You know, we are thinking about who should be punished, thinking that, uh, you know, basically trying to make sure that we achieve that deterrence goal, that we are really uh, effective in stopping uh, cartel activity. There is nothing in what I'm going to say that relates to compensatory damages that, that, uh, that, that should be set, uh, set aside. Now, if your objective is to deter cartel activity, then it seems pretty obvious that you should punish uh, those that make the decision to cartelize. And if anything, you should also punish those that help the implementation of the cartel. So you should go for the real agents, for the actors in, in the movie. Who is making the decision to cartelize? Who is organizing this cartel? And who are the, 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 those that are helping the cartel to materialize and to be effective? And so the question is, are they the shareholders or, or are those actors more likely to be the managers? And within the managers, we're likely to have top managers and, and middle managers playing roles in, in, this, uh, in, 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 in a cartel situation. Now, it seems to me that in most instances, the shareholders will not be the ones that organize the cartel. They may be happy if they see their profits going up, but they may not really understand what has been, you know, how the sausage was made, if I may put it in those, uh, in those terms. What, uh, what is that explain those, uh, those high results? They may incentivize the managers to provide them with uh, high profits, but they are not going to be the ones that decide, typically the ones that decide how the cartel is going to be organized and to implement the cartel. Now, if I'm right, then finding the shareholders only makes sense in limited circumstances, and in particular only makes sense when you think that, uh, you know, having received that fine, being the subject of that fine, that, or that, that, that the fine will incentivize them to take a number of actions that stop top management and middle management from engaging in cartel behavior. Now, is that something that uh, is uh, easy uh, to happen? Do, can we expect that shareholders, you know, feeling the risk of a very significant fine or having experienced one, 
will adopt measures to stop top management and middle management? Well, they will try to do some things. In fact, they may adopt compliance programs and 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 and, and, and force their top management, middle management, and in fact, everybody within the company to try to you know understand what the consequences of cartel activity are. But that that seems like soft, soft a uh, soft action, a very uh, an action that may not be. Uh, able to deter the cartel. I mean, there are plenty of companies that have compliance programs, some of them fairly sophisticated, and yet they find themselves in the middle of, uh, of, of cartels. Now, the other thing that shareholders may be able to do is to try to, you know, for example, uh, uh, reduce the, the bonuses of top managers and middle managers, uh, make uh, their pay less contingent on, on profits so that they reduce the incentives of those uh, managers to try to engage in cartel activity that increase uh, profits. But uh, that would run counter, to some extent, to the main objective of those shareholders, which is to align the incentives of those managers with, with their own incentives in terms of increasing, increasing profit, the profitability of the company. It may actually run counter to the solution of the principal agent problem that Dan was mentioning before. How on earth are you going to incentivize them to work hard to maximize profits when at the same time you don't want them to maximize profits just in case they engage in cartelized activity? And as a shareholder, you don't know how to distinguish what is the, uh, you know, what, what, what drive, uh, what drove, what, what, what explain those, uh, those high profits. Now, if, if I'm right on all this, I think that then the fine should be, should be set uh, elsewhere, it should not be placed on, on shareholders, on the firm, but it should be directed to uh, or targeted to the managers. Now, in my experience, top managers and middle managers uh, typically work almost like a team when when uh, when it relates to cartel activity some of them are in the coordinating committee typically the top managers agreeing what the objectives should be who's going to participate and what are the broad objectives of the cartel but then you need the implementers and those typically are the middle managers uh, those are the ones that perhaps don't go and meet in the super fancy hotels but meet more regularly in second tier restaurants or or hotels to try to see you know monitor what's going on see whether there have been deviations, establishing um, you know, some retaliation in case there have been deviations, ensuring, after all, that uh, the cartel is delivering what uh, it was meant to, to deliver. And so if those two groups of managers act as a team, then I think that we need to punish them both. And, uh, and we need to uh, try to act on their incentives, reduce their incentives to, 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 to participate in those, car in, the, in, in those cartels, in the cartel activity. Now, that means that we need to understand what drives their decisions to participate. Is it because they get very high bonus, the bonuses? Is it because they have a stock options whose value is going to increase if they increase the profitability of the firm? Is it that they are concerned that if they don't achieve certain goals, they are going to be um, you know, uh, fired? Is it that they believe that if they don't get outcomes that are very similar to those of their competitors, in the marketplace, shareholders are going to take action against them, again, fighting them. What is their concern? And depending on the concern, we should uh, act one way or another. So, for example, if we think that what drives them is pecuniary incentives, then again, you know, what we have to do is, to some extent, is apply the logic of the Becker model and, and set uh, fines so that uh, the crime doesn't pay, so that, uh, you know, we find them so much that the expected gain equals the, 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 the fine. And that's going to depend, obviously, on what is the probability of detection and enforcement. Now, when we think about managers and we think about deterring managers, then it becomes very clear that that probability may, be, may not be or need not be the objective probability of detection, but the subjective probability that the individual thinks uh, that, uh, that uh, with which it will, be, it will be caught. And one thing that we have uh, learned over the years when studying the psychology of people that engage in crime, and a cartel is a criminal activity, like many others, is that they tend to underestimate the probability that they will be caught. Uh, they are optimists. I mean, we are all optimists. That's why we all tend to think that none of us is going to suffer from, 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 from the virus. But, uh, but uh, I think the criminals tend to be more optimists than others. And that means that you know, we would have to impose very significant 
pecuniary fines on those people to stop them, which may mean that route, uh, you know, unattractive or ineffective because these guys may run very quickly into financial constraints in an inability to pay. And that means that we need to go in another route. And that's why we, when we typically fine individuals or punish individuals, we uh, consider actions such as custodial sanctions, as Dan was mentioning before, you know, incarceration, prison time, or uh, solutions like the ones that we have uh, seen in the UK, which is director disqualification as, uh, as an alternative. So I think that those are the, 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 the punishments that we would have to target on, on, on those managers to stop cartel activity. I think that there are a number of advantages if you punish managers as opposed to shareholders or, uh, or the firm. Uh, one was mentioned uh, before by Fred when he said that um, you know, if, you, if you punish the firm, the risk is that uh, the fines uh, end up being passed on to consumers. Uh, some people say that's not possible because the fines are fixed costs, but we know that uh, fixed costs may be passed on when firms are, for example, in financial distress or they may be passed on not perhaps in the form of higher prices, but they may be passed on on the form of lower investment in quality or investment uh, more in general. So I think that uh, the, the punishing uh, managers has the advantage that, uh, that there is less transferability of the fine and therefore perhaps the deterrence is going to be more effective. If we punish the middle man management and top management, may, we may create also some interesting you know, prisoner dilemma like uh, dynamics between the firm, the, the firm that even if it's not fine in the administrative proceeding, will still be concerned about damages. The top management and the middle management, all of them trying to get some uh, leniency, some, some forbearance, and, 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 and fighting with each other or gaming with each other, and that may facilitate actually detection and may, may enhance. Um, you know, the pro possibility of, of detention. I think that uh, leniency programs at the moment are tailored uh, thinking that the fines are imposed on the firms and, and if we move to fine managers, top managers or middle managers, we may need to adapt some of the leniency programs, but I think that uh, that is in any, in, in any way needed because the leniency programs, at least in Europe today, are under severe stress they're uh, under severe stress. They are not working as they were a few years ago uh, after the introduction of, uh, of private damages. Uh, people seem to be more reluctant, firms seem more reluctant uh, to go forward. And I think that uh, you know, maybe, maybe readapting those leniency pan uh, pan uh, programs together with uh, reorganizing the way that we punish so that we punish uh, managers could help. A final word, the last word, if despite everything that I have said in favor of punishing top managers and middle managers, you think that uh, shareholders shouldn't get away with the, the, uh, this and, and you want to do something in that respect, perhaps a solution that I think that would be worthwhile exploring is not um, the sort of fines that we have been imposing thus far, but our remedies or, 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 or uh, interventions that we have seen in other areas, like for example in banking regulation these days, like, uh, and I, the, the one that I have in mind precisely is, uh, you know, prohibitions or bans on the distribution of dividends, which uh, are, you know, perhaps much more likely to be affecting directly the interest of shareholders and much less likely to be transferred to consumers than other forms of, uh, of fines. But we need, to, we need to think more about that. It's not, it's not obvious, and I, I guess that uh, there, there may be some, some cons in that proposal. But you know, fairly interesting. I hope that uh, you have found this, you know, of shedding some light on the issue. I, I just wanted to add one comment to what Jorge was saying. Um, it's interesting, by the way, because at one point he talked about criminals and talking about the uh, violators. Um, and there's a question about whether they are criminals or not, um, which doesn't mean that if they are not criminals, they shouldn't be pursued for having violated uh, law. But I've always been struck by the fact that many of the participants to cartels at, at the operational level, I mean, the people who go to meetings and, and uh, very often they do this because they want an easy life, or because that's the way that it's been done traditionally in the firm and they don't want to rock the boat. And uh, okay. 
So they, in a sense, they are, it's disappointing. I mean, they are not there because they want to maximize profit for the firm or anything like that, but because it simplifies decisions. Um, okay, that's not to say that they shouldn't be punished. And, and I quite agree on the idea that uh, trying to get at the managers who are actually responsible for those uh, uh, practices is quite important. My experience has been, however, that it raises the standard of proof quite a bit. Um, you can get relatively easily the people who went to a cartel meeting uh, because by now there's a jurisprudence in many countries that just the fact that you were there is enough to say, even if you didn't say anything, is enough to make you a, a part of the uh, agreement. But what about the boss of those people? And uh, having served on the, uh, uh, on the OFT, I mean, I've seen a number of cases where the question was whether the boss knew or should have known that his employee was doing this um, when the boss was arguing that he didn't know, uh, that he had no idea what was going on. Um, and there you get into very difficult uh, issue of proof um, or if you simplify the problem by saying, well, I don't have the proof that you knew, but you should have known, sometimes you get into questionable uh, uh, practice, or at least it should be the, the criteria for the should have known should be very clear so that uh, uh, managers are very aware of the fact that uh, uh, if their uh, subordinates uh, engage into those practices. Uh, uh, but it's in a sense easier to sanction corporate bodies because you don't have to go in the body to look at personal responsibility so much uh, or personal uh, uh, behavior. So I still, I still agree with uh, what Holge said, uh, I, but it's not always so easy to find the people who should in the line of command where you should stop uh, when you want to punish the people. And what you don't want to do is only punish the last guy, the guy who went to the cartel meeting and was usually the lowest employee uh, very often without any decision making power. Uh, but he's the one that happens to be at the meeting and not having said, I don't want to hear about this. Um. Uh, if I could just add, add a comment to what Fred said. In the U.S., the first major uh, prosecution we had of a, of a cartel along these lines was the li Lysing Cartel, which we prosecuted when I was at the Department of Justice around uh, the, just before, the, I think, the year 1990, 1997, 1998. In that case, we, we had the advantage of films of the cartel meetings, uh, which are still available today on YouTube if anyone wants to watch them. And there we could see who was organizing the cartel, because the CEO, uh, for example, of the major U.S. company uh, was at each of the meetings right, and trying to make the cartel work. Uh, so in, in some sense, that was easy, but ultimately, uh, uh, um, who went to prison and how long they served became very complicated. But as the years have gone by, uh, we face more and more cartels that fit Fred's description, where often the people who actually attended the cartel meetings were not the key people who organized the cartel. Some of them were charged with simply taking minutes in one cartel I, I can think of. And so, it, uh, so uh, my own belief is that we need these custodial penalties because we're never going to have fines that deter sufficiently but still we have the problem that they may be imposed in a way that is not very equitable. But if I may add one thing on the comment of Dan, on the comment that I made, uh, just to go back to the uh, Baker model, uh, as we saw in the different costs and in the eventual result of deterrence, um, everything is interlinked. So if you change one thing, uh, you're going to change an incentive this is going to change the supply of, of criminal activity or the supply of, of violation, which itself is going to, I don't know, so, uh, lower the cost uh, of damage, but maybe uh, uh, increase the cost of sanction or maybe increase the cost of uh, finding out. So one has to think about this as a general system. The second thing I wanted to say is we have had the conversation where nobody among us has questioned the fact that deterrence was the objective of the law. You have a lot of legal minds out there who don't believe that, uh, uh, that uh, deterrence is necessarily the objective of sanction. Uh, you can have uh, rehabilitation, you can have incapacitation, uh, you can have all kinds of uh, different uh, retribution. Uh, okay. 
And the problem is that competition laws themselves are very silent on what is the purpose of the sanctions. I mean, they don't, uh, so it's a construct by the economists that if there are sanctions, they should be there to be deterred. But it's not necessarily shared by everyone. And that goes back to what I was talking about, about the, the difficulty between proportionality and deterrence that uh, I was uh, mentioning between economists and lawyers. Uh, isn't it the case that uh, a lot of the offenders are, are uh, not necessarily repeat offenders. So to the extent that, you know, rehabilitation is another option you mentioned by, you know, that some argue could be an option. How do we, how would that um, necessarily prevent first time offenders from committing the crime? If it's my recollection that uh, early on, I don't know if it's been done recently, but some violators were uh, sentenced to go and talk to universities and business groups about the ills of, of cartelization and, and uh, the virtues of competition. Uh, I don't know whether this is very effective, but this is a way at least to disseminate knowledge about the competition law and to say, I've been there myself, I have been caught, so I'm telling you, you should be aware of the fact that there is this law. You should be aware of the fact that there is a good reason for the law. And okay, so I mean that would be one example where you would that would be close to rehabilitation, for example, as a, as a, a uh, possible goal of, of the law. And you would have one instrument that would lead to rehabilitation. Some of the personal uh, sanctions that we've talked are pretty close to incapacitation when you tell someone that he cannot exercise any function on a board for the rest of his life, I mean, that's it. I mean, he cannot be in a position to decide uh, to have a corporate decision uh, of that kind. Um, so, but we're not always clear. I mean, economists only, thinks in, only think in terms of deterrence. Um, just the legal specialists think in, in broader terms of possible different objectives. Uh, Joanna, you mentioned uh, repeat offences, and I think that there is quite a bit of evidence in Europe of, uh, of uh, repeat offences. I think that there are companies that have uh, built a track record, and recidivism is one of the elements that is taken into account when calculating fines over here. And I think that that indicates uh, that uh, it can indicate several things. Maybe, it's, as was commented earlier on, that fines are set too low. Uh, second thing is that maybe we are imposing the fines on the wrong uh, entity and the corporation rather than individuals. But I think that we should reflect upon recidivism as, as a problem that indicates that there are things to fix in the system. I would like to, um, I think we've talked about, we've talked about the theory from, from Becker and as well as you know, some um, enforcement examples uh, in the different jurisdictions. I was wondering if, um, you know, maybe starting with you, Jorge, you could talk about uh, whether there are, you know, key empirical studies that inform upon um, optimal deterrence and enforcement and what they show. So the only studies that I'm aware of are work, for example, done by, by uh, Professor Mota and others trying to determine whether we were setting uh, optimal fines or not. And I think that they conclude that uh, we are setting fines that are way too low. And I think that, um, as, as I mentioned, I think that this is consistent with ev evidence of recidivism, etc. I think that uh, there is a lot of scope for, for additional work. I don't think that that is conclusive because I think that, um, as Fred mentioned before, you know, it's, it's a complicated exercise. And I think in particular there is one dimension that I want to highlight, which is that when we look at the effects of fines on, on cartel activity, we treat all cartels as if they were born equal. And, and they are not, especially in some jurisdictions. The definition of cartel has got quite broad, uh, especially in Europe. You have from blatant, naked, price-fixing arrangements to somewhat complicated and unclear information sharing schemes. And, uh, and when we uh, try to put everything together, we have, uh, we have problems. We may have that, uh, you know, companies that in the past were involved in price-fixing cartels, now they are involved in other types of activity, and we conclude that that means that they are repeat offenders and that our fines were too low. I think that, unfortunately, we are 
quite short of what we should be in our understanding of whether we are finding correctly or not and the way in which we could improve the current situation. Dan, Fred, anything more to add on that? Well, I would say I, I, uh, the evidence I've seen uh, is consistent with what Jorge has said, which is that fines, fines imposed on firms are likely too low. And, and uh, often, by the way, uh, they're, they're not working quite well because the owners of the firm are changing over time as shareholders move in and out of a company. So it's not even clear that you're imposing the fine on the appropriate person. If your goal is broader than deterrence, uh, you're not going to achieve it very well by imposing a large fine. So uh, the real area we need to work on is to understand uh, better how, uh, how prison sentences really work in terms of deterrence. My, my informal sense is that they're quite effective, that, uh, that, uh, that they do make a difference. But there's even there a debate about how long the prison sentence should be. Uh, early on, some uh, Greg Worden and others thought we didn't need a very long custodial penalty. Just the signal of, of going to prison would be enough. I'm not sure that's right. I think it may be that, that uh, we, we have to think about longer custodial penalties because most of them are in practice relatively short uh, because even if there's, a say, a three-year sentence imposed, the person will not serve the full three years, at least in the U.S. So that's a really open area for further work. Um, I think that, first of all, I think that criminal sanctions have, a, in any case, have a function in the sense that they justify high fines. If the violation could land you in jail for a number of years, then it's perfectly justified that I don't send you to jail, but I give you a very high fine. Uh, and there is quite a bit uh, of this. I mean, the symbolic value of putting people in jail, I think, is quite important. This explains how the Justice Department of the U.S. would do anything to get uh, cartelists to, foreign cartelists to come to spend some time in jail. In, uh, you would go to a really nice jail and, and you could have tea uh, every afternoon. And, uh, okay. and I've had some lawyers describe to me what those jails were like. Uh, but at least I can say that those people have been in jail and that creates a, a feeling uh, that it's uh, really serious. And I think that this has worked, uh, in fact, that the fact that in the U.S. in particular, there's been a, 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 an insistence on, on jailing people has made many other countries more severe about their cartels. And this has slowly but surely been accepted by the judges who are the most reticent because of uh, their uh, uh, idea of proportionality. On the effectiveness, I'm a bit less... Um, uh, enthusiastic uh, about uh, than Jorge about the work uh, which has been done by economists. For example, if we talk about recidive, uh, there has been huge controversies uh, in the U.S. between Warden and, and others about how one count them, uh, whether it's the result of mergers and uh, therefore all of a sudden one part of the firm used to be sanctioned for something which has nothing to do with uh, what is really at stake. And in Europe at least, or at least in France, I mean, there's been huge controversy between uh, people like uh, Combe and others who have used the uh, John Connor uh, kind of approach to argue the fact that the sanctions were uh, under deterrent. And some quite respectable uh, economies from Toulouse who have shown that, uh, I mean, questioning largely the assumptions and the results. Uh, uh, that have been. So I think that I tend to agree with Dan Rubenfeld that uh, more work is needed, but I, I think that economies should not claim that they have really gotten very far in terms of either measuring or even being certain of the uh, uh, deterrence aspect of the sanctions that they put. Wonderful. Um, well. Fred, Dan, and Jorge, thank you very much for this very informative discussion today. Um, this concludes our program. <laughs>